Would it be fantastic if a judge just outlined and threw down the arguments out there for knocking down all the assault weapons bans that are going on across this whole country and probably someday in DC? We have that. We're going to cover it exactly in this video. This judge did an amazing job of hitting all sorts of different things when a state of Illinois tried to take away so-called high capacity firearms and magazines, not to mention specifically targeting AR-15s. But before we get into that, guys, there's a secret giveaway going on right now. Now, I can't tell you what it is, otherwise the algorithm might slap us down. You can find out information for it in the description box below. It's absolutely free and it ends really soon. It may be something that is a remote paper puncher, goes in a holster, something like that. So be sure to check that out. But guys, let's get into this. So a federal judge in the Southern District Court of Illinois just at the end of April issued a preliminary injunction against this law, which doesn't mean that the fight is over. It simply means that the judge pressed pause on the law going into effect. Now, of course, this is going to be appealed up to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and then potentially beyond that all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, where ultimately these sorts of issues are going to wind up getting resolved. But what are the exact legal issues and nuances? So we have a judge who did an excellent job breaking this down and I want to make sure that you understand again some of the issues that are in there I'm gonna do my best to put it into English for you rather than plain legalese but if you are a masochist feel free to check out the link to the 29 page decision below he actually did a really good job of putting it itself in plain English I'm gonna be quoting from it heavily so the judge starts off by saying that PICA seems to be written in spite of the clear directives from New York Rifle State Pistol Association v Brune and as well as the Heller decision, not in conformity with them. What are we talking about? Bruin and Heller are the two US Supreme Court decisions, Bruin, of course, from June of 2022, Heller from 2008, that have solidified a lot of what the gun rights and rules and laws are. So the judge just basically from the outset is saying, look, PICA has been written in spite of what these cases say, not in conformity with them. And he goes on to say, quote, whether well-intentioned, brilliant, or arrogant, no state may enact a law that denies its citizens rights that the Constitution guarantees them. Even legislation that may enjoy the support of the majority of its citizens must fail if it violates the constitutional rights of fellow citizens. That's extremely important. The media and all these other groups out there keep saying, oh, X percentage or Y percentage of people support this particular gun control or that particular gun control. Great irrelevant. Just because something is not popular or maybe the reverse, it is popular, does not mean that we can take away a right. That is not what a right is. A right is something that you have that is inalienable. It may have limits, but within those limits, that is not something that can be taken away. If it could be taken away, it would not be a right. It would be a licensed privilege and likely not worth the cheap plastic that the license was even printed on. Now, the standard for injunctive relief, because again, the court didn't strike down the law. They pressed pause and they granted an injunction. That injunction is going to be getting appealed and on and on and on we go. So let's start with some of the law here, okay? And again, plain English. There's basically four things that they're going to have to show, although you could kind of break it down into two. The four things are that the plaintiff, those are the good guys who are suing the law, are sometimes called the movement because they're the one moving for the injunction. The movement will suffer irreparable harm in the interim prior to the final resolution of the lawsuit. Number two, there is no adequate remedy at law. Number three, the movement has a reasonable likelihood of success on the merits. And then number four, there's an interest balancing of harm to the plaintiff as well as the public if the injunction is granted or not granted. So let's work through these one by one, and we're going to cover a lot of constitutional law on exactly these sort of issues in the process. So number one is we're talking about irreparable harm. Now, interim injunctive relief, that's again where the judge presses pause, is only available if a plaintiff will suffer irreparable harm before the final judgment is entered which requires, quote, more than a mere possibility of harm, end quote. Now, the Seventh Circuit has found irreparable harm when it cannot be prevented or fully rectified by the final judgment after trial. In other words, there is irreparable harm if, look, if we did the whole case and if basically, let's say the movement wins, the plaintiff wins, but there's something that cannot be fixed in the back end, that's irreparable harm. Interestingly enough, by the way, First Amendment cases have presumed irreparable harm in them. First Amendment, of course, governing freedom of speech, freedom of religion, that kind of stuff. So if the law or if the government passes some sort of law that regulates or seeks to regulate sort of ban a First Amendment speech issue, it's presumed 
that there is immediate irreparable harm. And although the U.S. Supreme Court has not recognized such a presumption of irreparable harm in regards to the Second Amendment violations, it has emphasized that the Second Amendment and the constitutional right to bear arms for self-defense is not a, quote, second-class right subject to entirely different body of rules than the other Bill of Rights guarantees, end quote. That's from New York Rifle State Pistol Association v. Brune, by the way. And that's also actually citing to another case, the McDonald versus City of Chicago decision, another big case which came out back in 2010. So when a law is facially challenged under the Second Amendment, the form of the claim and the substance of the Second Amendment right creates a harm that is properly regarded as irreparable and having no adequate remedy of law, the judge says. And by the way, even if you do decide that there's no imputed irreparable harm. So even if you decide, you know what, S Second Amendment, second class right, you can still find irreparable harm present. For example, Barnett, that's one of the many plaintiffs here, as well as Norman, another one of the many plaintiffs, are no longer able to purchase any firearms, attachment devices, magazines, or others that were banned under PICA. While of course, different manufacturers, as well as different stores are prohibited from manufacturing and selling any of the items banned under PICA. These harms are irreparable, the court finds, and are in direct violation of the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms in self-defense. Now, the number two thing is there is no adequate remedy under law. There's really not much to talk about here. The law basically banned all this stuff and without a preliminary injunctive relief, there's nothing to be done otherwise. Number three, the movement has a reasonable likelihood of success on the merits. Okay, so now we're really getting into this. So in Heller, that's the 2008 Supreme Court case, which basically began all the modern analysis of this and solidified the right that it is an individual's right to keep and bear arms. So in Heller, the Supreme Court began its analysis by setting forth that the Constitution should be interpreted according to the principle that it was written to be understood by the normal and ordinary meaning of the words. This principle leads to an interpretation of the Second Amendment that contains two distinct clauses, the prefatory clause as well as the operative clause, along with things like, well, the word militia, and what do all those mean and so forth. Moving on, we're gonna set that to the side. The Supreme Court in Bruin adopted a single step test rooted in the Second Amendment's text as informed by history, their words, not mine, great words, under which the quote, government must affirmatively prove that its firearm regulation is part of the historical tradition that delimits the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms, end quote. Under this framework, basically, the Second Amendment protects the possession and use of weapons that are in common use at the time, thus showing that a historical analog, in other words, something similar historically, need not be a historical twin. Okay, I'm throwing a lot of technical stuff at you. I'm going to break this down. But rather, it's simply that it has to be similar. So in other words, look, in order for the government to pass a modern day law, it has to show how that modern day law fits within the nation's historical tradition. And to do so, they just need to find an analog, something similar to that that existed in historical tradition, time and place. It doesn't have to be a historical twin limiting, for instance, magazine size or something like that. And of course, relatively similar as a well-established and representative historical analog will pass constitutional muster, the court basically says. How do we break that down into English in court? There's two metrics to apply this. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but guys, it's a video. You can pause, you can rewind. There are two metrics to apply in undertaking the historical analog analysis according to the court. There's the how and the why the regulations burden the right to keep and bear arms. The Bruin court noted that there's constitutional rights that are enshrined with the scope that they were understood to have when the people adopted them. And when it comes to interpreting the constitution, not all history is created equal. I have a fantastic series that we're rolling out. We've already got multiple videos in it talking about the racist history of gun control. And the fact that the majority of all gun control laws originated in this country and the preceding colonies that of course came before the United States in the War for Revolution in 1776 were basically all racist in nature. And that actually goes all the way up through the 20th century. So if you want to know more about that, be sure to check it out. A short-lived law that precedes the framing or a post-enactment law of the framing, 1791 is when the Second Amendment was passed, must not be given undue weight. So if a, if a law was enacted, but it quickly goes in and out or something like that or isn't enforced, let's not go overboard on this is what the Supreme Court is saying. Accordingly, no matter what the post-ratification adoption or acceptance of the law is, it is inconsistent with the original meaning of the Constitution 
then it cannot overcome the change of the text. So what the court's saying is, look, if some sort of law is just completely inconsistent with the Second Amendment, that law doesn't supersede the Second Amendment. It's not part of the Constitution, which the Second Amendment is. So again, this all has to be not only historical and has to fit within the historical framework, but it cannot supersede and overwhelm the Second Amendment itself. So with that in mind, we get to accessories and things like magazines and all that kind of stuff. Illinois argues that accessories and weapons that are most useful in military service are not arms under the plain text of the Second Amendment. Now, of course, PICA outlaws certain magazines based on size and all that kind of stuff. And the court did a great analysis of this. They say it is hard to imagine something more closely correlated to the right to use a firearm in self-defense than the ability to effectively load ammunition into the firearm. In other words, loading ammunition to the firearm is absolutely part of the firearm. And the Third Circuit, by the way, recognized the importance of this corollary and held that, quote, a magazine is an arm under the Second Amendment. That's the Association of New Jersey Rifle and Pistol Clubs versus Attorney General of New Jersey. That's a 2018 Third Circuit Court of Appeals decision. So that's number one. The Third Circuit Court of Appeals has already ruled that an accessory such as a magazine, absolutely part of the firearm, it's integral to the function of the firearm. But the court also goes on and basically there's a bit of a gotcha moment, which we'll see if the government keeps repeating this mistake elsewhere. But the judge ordered an evidentiary hearing on this particular issue on whether or not to grant this. And Illinois put on an expert to talk about all this kind of stuff. The judge wrote that further the defendant's own expert defined, quote, high capacity firearms, end quote, as handheld arms with a capacity greater than 10 rounds, recognizing the Illinois statute allows up to 15 rounds for handguns. The court says that the defendant's expert is clearly referencing magazines and incorporating such into their definition of what is a firearm. If defendant's own experts incorporates magazine capacity into the definition of what is a firearm, given his level of expertise, it would be unreasonable to expect the original public meaning of the plain text, let alone the public today, to not reflect a similar understanding. So the judge basically kind of reflects back exactly the fact that, look, part of defining uh, what these weapons are, the Illinois expert use the size of the magazine. We also then get to the so-called common use issue. And Illinois argues, look, these are not in common use. They argued, quote, neither large capacity magazines nor assault weapons were in common use when the Second Amendment and 14th Amendment were ratified. The judge says this argument is, quote, bordering on the frivolous, end quote, because Second Amendment applies to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the passage back in 1791. Or perhaps, I would say, especially those items that were not in existence back in 1791, because what's going to be the best way of defending yourself? Pulling out the old single shot musket or pulling out something like an AR-15 or a semi-automatic handgun? Right. What's going to be best for common defense? You tell me. And now which one do you think the Second Amendment is going to apply to more? Right. You tell me. So the judge basically slaps that down right away. And then, but we will continuously see that come up. So the judge basically just slaps that down, but then he moves on to address Illinois' next argument. Illinois then went on to say that the act restricts weapons and accessories not commonly used for self-defense today. Right, so Illinois is saying, look, AR-15s are not used for self-defense today. High capacity magazines, greater than 15 rounds in this bigger instance, as well as other weapons targeted by this ban, these are not in common use for self-defense today. So they're moving the goalposts and the judge calls him out on this. Why? Because Bruin clearly holds that the Second Amendment protects possession and use of weapons in common use, not weapons that are in common use for self-defense, as Illinois is arguing. So the government tries a sleight of hand to move the goalposts to say, oh, it's only common use for self-defense. No, not the way this works out. And even if, by the way, the judge points out, though, that if you do want to make this a requirement of the common use has to be an arm for self-defense, he points out that AR-15 style rifles would meet such a test, considering that 34.6% of owners utilize these rifles for self-defense outside of their home, as well as 61.9% utilize them for self-defense inside the home. AR-15s, which are obviously the quintessential rifle that the gun grabbers are targeting with all this kind of stuff. This is going to be very difficult for them, thanks to the Bruin common use language, in order to ban and outlaw. Why? I'm going to leave you with this fact. AR-15s are the most popular arm produced in the United States, accounting for nearly half of all rifles produced in 2018 and nearly 20% of all firearms of any type sold in 2020. 
20%. If you think about how many probably hundreds and hundreds of firearms that are out there that are in sale at any point in time, hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands, maybe even tens of thousands, but we'll just keep it easy and say hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. You've got one firearm that accounts for 20%. That's going to be so far in common use. If that doesn't count as common use, nothing counts as common use. My name's Tom Grieve, former state criminal prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Be sure to check out my channel at Tom Grieve, linked in the comments below. Thanks for sticking around.